go. Hi, everybody. We are going to be talking today to Tom Wagner. He is a scientist who works for NASA, although he is here with me as a public citizen to answer questions. My name is Mary Robinette Kowal. I'm an author and I am writing a book right now. And one of the things we I like to do is talk to people who know more than I do to get information for these books. So let me tell you a little bit about Tom. Uh, Tom is um, a space scientist. He's based in Washington, D.C. He currently leads NASA's Discovery Program, which develops robotic missions to explore the solar system. While he's also serving as NASA's program scientist for the Dragonfly mission to Saturn's moon Titan, which is really cool. Uh, Tom's career started in geology, but after a PhD spent making magma in a basement lab at MIT, he struck out for the South Pacific. And while teaching at the University of Papua New Guinea, he studied volcanoes, dived to the Great Barrier Reef, and consulted for the United Nations and World Bank on development projects. He later moved to the U.S. Antarctica program and has been to the South Pole like six times. I have to tell you, just so you understand, Fewer people have been to the South Pole than have been to space. Um, so he's uh, that this includes crossing the Drake Passage by ship. Um, over the years, Tom has created numerous government research programs focused on climate change, sea level rise, and the Earth's icy regions. He's also served on various government committees and is a regular reviewer of climate change assessments. Outside of NASA, Tom moonlights as a, space, a science consultant and futurist for movies, televisions, video games, and novelists like me. Uh, he can otherwise be found talking to everyone from kids to business executives about global warming and curious facts about other planets. Um, so with all of that said, I'd like to welcome Tom to, uh, to join me here talking about all of this, um, all of this, this excitement. Um, so, Tom, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, you, I'm delighted. So I'm going to start you off with the, the question that I kind of ask everyone when I get them into my tiny little Zoom uh, kingdom. Um, so I just read out your bio, but what do you actually do? Yeah, my, that bio makes me feel old. But, <laughs> right. Uh, my day job is mostly PowerPoint and email, just like the rest. <laughs> the, uh, what I do right now is, so I'm in the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters, and what we do is pick and manage the missions that explore the solar system. We have a couple of different programs that do that. Uh, the one that I run is called Discovery, and it's what's called a competing program. Like, people put proposals into NASA and say, hey, I want to go to Venus and do this. And then we evaluate them to figure out whether we should spend your taxpayer dollars on doing things like that. And then on top of that, I serve in other roles. Like for the Dragonfly mission, what I do is I help them um, get the mission all set up to meet all the NASA rules and regulations. I check to make sure that the science that they're going to do is in line with what they said they would do and watch how things develop along the way. Work on things like communications and outreach and things like that for the mission too. And then on occasion, like I still run some research programs and things. You know, like somebody wants to apply machine learning to craters on asteroid Vesta, stuff like that. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so when when you say the checking to see if the science that they said they were going to do is actually the science that they're doing, like, can you give me an example of? Like, I I I. Yeah. So somebody puts a proposal in and says, "Take the Dragonfly mission to Titan." They put a proposal into a different program actually called New Frontiers. And the difference between New Frontiers and Discovery is New Frontiers is a more recent program and it's larger. So like the New Horizons mission that went to Pluto, mm -hmm. that's New Frontiers. Got it. Um, or the OSIRIS-REx mission that's about to come back with samples from an asteroid, that was New Frontiers. But like first rover on Mars, that was Discovery. Uh, and a whole bunch of other ones. All the impact studies and stuff that you saw like crashing into a comet and things, those were Discovery. 
Got it. So what happens is a group of people puts in a proposal. The proposal can be for like a half a billion or a billion dollars, right, or more. Mm -hmm. And along the way, as things develop, sometimes things change. Like the camera you want to develop maybe can't do exactly what we thought it would do or the radar system or whatever it is. Or maybe there's something we realize is going to be interference with the spacecraft. Or maybe the spacecraft isn't going to survive as long as we hoped it would. So along the way, we got to check and make sure that they can still do all the work that they said that they were going to do. Got it. What happens when a mission changes after it's out? Like, um, you know, like with with uh, InSight, when the... Um, which I realize is a... I'm just using it as an example because I... Because it's that the one that discovery I discovery mission. That was my it, okay. It was great. So like, yeah. so when when uh, when you get you know you get to Mars and it's like we're gonna drill into Mars and then you get there and it's like oh no that's nothing is working the way we thought like when it got jammed, what um, how does that? I know that there's all this stuff that's happening at JPL and things like that, but how are is are you involved in any kind of is, is discover how does discovery interface with that? So a mission has these requirements, like, hey, we're going to do this kind of science at SpaceX. And along the way, if something goes wrong, we evaluate it. And if it's a serious enough problem, at NASA can actually tri- trigger like an accident review board, hmm. you know, to go and see what really went on or co- find, try to understand why it didn't meet its requirements. You know, you still can't go fix it, right? right. But what we're always trying to do is learn from our mistakes and how can we do better next time. Um, so the accident review board is one of the things that we're going to be talking about when we go backstage for my Patreon supporters, because gotcha. strangely, I know this is going to shock everybody, but something goes wrong on a space mission in my space book. What? Really? In a novel, something goes terribly wrong? Um, in real life, it goes wrong all the time, too. <laughs> right. How many... Usually, though, it's small stuff that goes wrong. Right. Usually, there's a way to recover because so much planning goes into it, but we can talk about it later. No, no, yeah. Um, how many people do you work with? Like, it is are in the discovery program. So I'm at headquarters, um, and I have some. We have probably about a dozen and a half people that are scientists like me that work on science for planetary science. The people like me that run the big programs. There's one other one of us in planetary, and there's you know there's a couple of us in Earth science, and a couple of us in the other division in NASA headquarters. But then the people I work with on the projects and the engineers and things, you know, that's many hundreds. Okay, yeah, right. That's... So, Sorry. for example, like, next week we're going to be doing a big review of one of the missions. And it's, uh, what we do is, like, we convene an external board to look at the mission and see how it's being developed. And just on that external board, there's something like 20 people, and there'll be probably 100 people from the project that present on all the different aspects of things that they're working on. You know, these are always, what's, I think what's hard to understand is it's the exact opposite of like the Henry Ford thing, right? Like we don't make a million of one thing and refine it. Every time we build something, it's brand new. Right. And so people try to trace out everything that can possibly go wrong. Right. I was just talking with someone else about, um, the uh, things like um, RVs in the U.S. Apparently, every RV is unique because there's not really a production line. Oh, um, and the the Hurricane, which was an airplane in World War II, the, one of the reasons that it was widely used was because a production line was created for it. And I think that we do we do think about we don't think about how bespoke things can be, especially when it's like a one-off. It's like, we're going to send this to Mars. Right. Um, yeah. What What does a good day look like for you? Uh, <laughs> you know, a good day is when I learn some new science. So one of the other things that I'm doing all day long is I'm re- in between doing meetings and email and PowerPoint. I'll be reading scientific papers thinking about where the field is going next, interacting with researchers. Like today I got an email from somebody who's working on Mercury who's like, hey, this project we're working on is going great. We need more money released for the project. You know, we've had these kind of results and we need our next year of funding. Um, today I was on a meeting about Venus. We're planning a scientific conference for it around Ooh. this vision called Envision that NASA's doing jointly with ESA. So as you plan a scientific 
going to the conference, there's all kinds of things like, you know, who's going to present, who's going to have a poster, how do you pick who's going to present, how do you fund it all. So do a lot of those kinds of things too. But on a good day, I'm learning new stuff. That's my favorite. That's, can you tell me a, a thing that you have learned recently that you got excited about? One of the wild things, and I didn't know anything about this, is the geologic processes that occur on Mercury are wild. Oh. And there are things on Mercury that are almost like ices, but they're made of like sulfur-bearing minerals. And on occasion, they have collapsed features and devolatilized, just like when ice gets exposed to the sun. There is some strange stuff that goes on on Mercury. There's also what people talk about are these kind of contractional tectonic features, like when Mercury might be contracting a bit and squeezing things together. And even though the messenger mission, you know, was there over a decade ago, mm -hmm. people are still chewing through all the data and they're coming up with new approaches. And, you know, I mentioned machine learning earlier. Right. You know, it's one of the most exciting things is that people find, instead of, say, going out and looking at craters and mapping them by hand, you know, now there's the possibility to go and take this algorithm and have it go through and identify all these weird features. You know, like, you might want to know things like this. Like, when you get a crater, it's almost like, um, it's kind of like putting down a marker in time. Mm -hmm. So then if a fault forms, it cuts across the crater and offsets it. You know, that's interesting. Right. Or if another crater overlaps it, you know, a younger crater or older crater, what's exposed at the bottom of the crater. There's a lot of things like that that we can work on that are kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. And machine learning is becoming an ever more important tool for all that. And is the machine, so the machine, when we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about machines here that are learning from data that's sent back. We're not talking about send, about sending like AI to, to Titan. So one thing, we do talk about that for the next generation oh. of missions because there's such a long lag time that if you can have automation locally that can make decisions about where to go and what's interesting, we talk about that a lot. That's the next generation of things to do, especially when you start getting out past Mars or something, right? Mm -hmm. Where the time delay, you know, is just so long. And if you have things that are flying, especially like we do on Titan. Another thing, though, is that we're really bandwidth limited in terms of getting data back. So, for example, radar data files are really big, gigabytes of data, right, from that sensor every day. Um, that takes a lot of bandwidth, you know, and it's coming from a little antenna on a mission that's millions of miles away. you got to take your great big antennas on Earth and point them there, but things are always going over the horizon. So you don't have a lot of bandwidth. So if you can do onboard processing of the data and not, you know, only send back the JPEG instead of sending back everything else, um, you can get a lot more data back that covers a wider area than you could if you just covered one small area. Oh, that makes sense. And so machine learning and compression algorithms are Oh, yeah. Huh. You know, even on the Earth, like at the South Pole, right? Right. We used to have the seismic. And this is kind of when, like, um, the Iridium constellation first went up. You know, it was the, the big, you know, the satellite cell phones that were big. Yeah. Um, you know, their original case was they were going to sell it to business people back in the late 90s, early on. But what happened was that model fell apart. But people in the military, people in the science community were like, wait a minute, I can put a modem in the middle of nowhere, make it solar powered and get data back? You know? Right. Actually, so like at South Pole Station, we had a seismometer. And what it would do is it was collecting background information all the time. And then a couple of times a year, we would get that by an aircraft flight from South Pole. But we would have picks. Like if it was a big event, we would send that event back by a radio. And it's similar in space, too. Oh, yeah. Can you spell iridium for me? I-R-I-D-I-U-M. Oh, that it's is... commercially available. You can buy an Iridium phone. A lot of times, like, people climbing Everest and stuff like that, they can make that. Uh, uh, that is how I spelled it, so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long were you at, in the, at the South Pole? You, six times? like. So I worked in the U.S. Antarctic program for about uh, five, five plus years. And so every year I would go down for one to two months Antarctica and be like, you know, the lead scientist on station, um, either in McMurdo, which is the main U.S. base, or, you know, I go to South Pole more for trips to see how my projects are yeah. doing. I got to go in the old dome that used to be there before they dismantled it. I remember when I was a kid, I remember seeing
seen like in the Guinness Book of World Records, there was something about the dome at South Pole. Like, I forget what it was. But, you know, that I got to spend the night in it because it was great. <laughs> what was it like? Tell me that. Like, what, what are your <laughs> sense memories of that? So, what's fascinating is you have never met a harder working, more motivated group of people than Poli. Right? Like, they are get the job done. And when they're not getting the job done, they're cleaning, right? Like they, they do this thing they call the house mounts where they all take care of the station because there's not a lot of um, extra right. people there. Work super hard, work all the time, incredible, all nights, friendly, you know. Um, when I was sat there and I just crawled, I saw this building, and I was a little lucky because I worked for the National Science Foundation because they were in charge. And I just climbed up into this observatory, and I opened the trap door, and I, and this, I heard this woman's voice like, Hello? <laughs> what? What? Who are you and what are you doing in this remote corner of South Pole? Which is, you know, um, and there are tunnels under it and all kinds of things. But going in the dome was, was pretty amazing. The funniest thing was there was a rubber chicken hanging from the middle of it at the side. The South Pole people do all kinds of pranks. That's things. great. The CBs built it. It's in the CB Museum in Fort Miami now in California, I think. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so rubber chicken prank. All right. Um, the other one was it was wild because it was this do- this sort of dome, and it was like supported on three or four corners. And uh, inside, though, were small little buildings made out of plywood. So it was almost like Lego buildings inside a dome. Yeah. Not huge, you know, pretty big. You know, you you drive a truck in it, say like that. But yeah. Not, you know, not like as big as a Home Depot at most in size. Yeah. So, Right. Um, do you remember what the sound was like? No, although I generally remember being pretty quiet. And I remember the tunnels under South Pole, the ice was being really quiet. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, people are working. It's pretty busy up there, right? Like, in the summer months when people like me go, there is stuff going on all the time. There's planes landing, tractors driving around, you know, and... Everything is U.S. OSHA kind of standard, so there's beeping as people are backing up, as people with flags and stuff like that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of hubbub in the summer, and then in the winter, you know, I never went in the winter, but talking to people who were there, it's pretty quiet. Yeah, I have a friend who's wintering there. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And um, they all have great stories. Yeah. Very intense bunch. Yeah. They take their fun seriously. Yeah, she she uh, she sends me photos, not photos, texts every now and then, um, and uh, yeah, and also took uh, took one of my books down and put it in the McMurdo Library, which oh, that's great. makes me really happy. Um, yeah, uh, cool. Um, do you remember any smells? You know, we used to joke about, like, the when you get back and you have all the smells of green in the, in the you know, off ice yeah. world. You know, it, it's not, remember, people, hygiene's always an issue, right? Because you got to minimize the amount of water use, right? So right. stuff isn't getting clean all the time. You're not showering every day, those kinds of things, is what people would say. There's a more impolite way that I'll tell you later if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um Actually, speaking of which, uh, I think we've been going for about 20 minutes, so I think at this point it's time for us to go backstage. Uh, If anyone's watching and wants to join in, you can hop over to my Patreon, uh, Patreon slash Mary Robinette, et cetera, and so forth, uh, where I'm going to ask Tom some questions about accidents in space because um, I need need some things to – I'm I'm breaking things. I'm breaking things in space. All right. Thank you all so much.